Cardiac muscle cells is the topic of this screencast. You may find information on cardiac muscle cells in chapter 11 of your textbook. This screencast was designed to achieve the following objectives. Compare the following in skeletal muscle fibers and cardiac myocytes. Generation and nature of action potentials. Source of calcium for muscle contraction. Length of contraction. The stimulation of muscle cells to contract. And the source of ATP. Lastly, describe intercalated discs. You have a good understanding by now of the anatomy and physiology of skeletal muscle tissue, so I thought I could compare the cardiac muscle tissue with skeletal muscle tissue. Both skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle tissue are striated. Myofilaments are organized into sarcomeres within myofibrils. The sarcomeres have dark or A bands and light or I bands. And the mechanism of contraction is basically the same where calcium ions bind to protein complexes on the thin filaments that allows cross bridges to form between the thick filaments and the thin filaments. With the forming of those cross bridges, you have the power stroke and you have the contraction of the sarcomeres. So the basic mechanism, there are a few little refinements, but the basic mechanism of contraction within cardiac muscle cells or cardiac myocytes are the same as found in skeletal muscle fibers. Where the myocytes differ from skeletal muscle fibers is in the way they are stimulated to contract. Recall that each skeletal muscle fiber is stimulated to contract by a motor neuron. And the skeletal muscle fibers are organized into motor units. The myocytes, in contrast, are all electrically connected to one another through gap junctions. If you recall, gap junctions are communicating junctions. They allow ions to move from one cell to the next. So if an action potential occurs in one cardiac myocyte, ions can flow from that cell to the adjacent cardiac myocyte, effectively conducting an action potential to the next cell. And an action potential can then be conducted from that cell to the next and from that cell to the next and so on and so forth. So this interconnectivity allows all of the myocytes in a chamber to all contract at the same time, and that ensures that the heart muscle beats as a single unit. This is a sample of cardiac muscle tissue, and I am sure you remember it well from the tissues lab that we had earlier in the semester. Notice that cardiac muscle tissue, like skeletal muscle tissue, is striated. However, what cardiac muscle tissue contains that skeletal muscle tissue does not are the intercalated discs. And these intercalated discs, these junctions between adjacent cardiac myocytes, include the gap junctions that I just discussed and desmosomes. This figure from your book shows the general arrangement of cardiac myocytes. Notice that there are intercalated discs between adjacent cardiac myocytes, and again, they contain desmosomes and gap junctions. The desmosomes, if you recall, are anchoring junctions. They help prevent the cardiac myocytes from pulling away from one another as the cell contracts. Gap junctions are communicating junctions, allowing ions to move from one cell to the next cell to the next cell, so forth and so on. This allows action potentials that are generated in one cardiac myocyte to spread to the adjacent myocyte and then to the next myocyte and then to the next myocyte. Therefore, an action potential generated in one cardiac myocyte can spread throughout uh, an entire chamber, allowing the chamber as a whole to contract.
while action potentials can move throughout an entire chamber, they do not move from atria to ventricles or from ventricles to atria. And that's because there are no intercalated discs connecting cells of the atria with the cells of the ventricle. In fact, there is a fibrous skeletal barrier that electrically separates the cells of the atria from the cells of the ventricles, as shown here in this figure from your book. There are some other significant differences between skeletal muscle fibers and cardiac myocytes uh, that I'd like to discuss. And one of those is the nature of their action potentials. If you recall, in skeletal muscle fibers, neurotransmitters cause the opening of sodium channels, which cause depolarizations, which lead to the production of an action potential. That action potential causes the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The calcium then binds to protein complexes on the thin filament that um, allows cross-bridge formation and contraction of the sarcomeres. Now, all of that is true in cardiac myocytes as well, except there is also calcium that enters the cytoplasm from the extracellular fluid. And since calcium ions are positively charged, this extends the depolarization or the length of the action potential. Also, the calcium ions from the extracellular fluid can interact with the protein complexes on the thin filaments in the same way that calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum does. So not only is the action potential extended, but the length of contraction of the cardiac myocytes is extended as well. And this is important because the cardiac myocytes need to contract for a longer period of time in order to enable the chambers of the heart to empty. Another difference between cardiac myocytes and skeletal muscle fibers is the fact that there are a small number of cardiac myocytes that are autorhythmic. That is, they don't have to be stimulated by a motor neuron in order to produce an action potential and contract. They can spontaneously depolarize, producing an action potential and an associated contraction. And lastly, uh, the, another difference between cardiac myocytes and skeletal muscle fibers is their capacity to produce energy by anaerobic fermentation. If you recall, most energy produced in a skeletal muscle fiber comes from aerobic respiration, but a percentage does come from anaerobic respiration as well. Cardiac myocytes are much more dependent on aerobic respiration than skeletal muscle fibers. They really don't have much of an enzyme system that can produce ATP through anaerobic fermentation. That is why a loss of blood flow and oxygen to any part of the heart for um, any time at all can have such a devastating effect on cardiac muscle tissue because they simply cannot produce much ATP from mechanisms other than aerobic respiration. Now let's review the objectives of this screencast. Compare the following in skeletal muscle fibers and cardiac myocytes. Generation and nature of action potentials. Source of calcium for muscle contraction length of contraction, the stimulation of muscle cells to contract, and the source of ATP. Lastly, describe intercalated discs. The cardiac conduction system is the topic of the next screencast.